Okay, welcome everybody, and uh, I'm just now talking about the, um, it all started with 12 people story, um, which is uh, simply taken from Acts chapter 18, and um, it goes through to chapter 20 verse 1, and it actually is the story of the planting of a church in the city of Ephesus, and how that church not only impacted the city of Ephesus itself, but um but the whole of the province of Asia, so uh, and then became an amazing church that you know uh, did things all around the world, and um, uh, and we know the church is important because uh, Paul wrote a letter there, the letter to the Ephesians. Jesus spoke uh, through John, the uh, John the Apostle on the island of Patmos, uh, Revelation chapter two, I think it is, the Church of Ephesus. Uh, some years later, maybe 20 or 30 years after this. But um, uh, so I just want to go through this thing because what I'm talking about is here is a story and uh, this story illustrates uh, um, principles, uh, revelatory principles, that is principles of the way that God works, which um, God doesn't work the way that you know, other people do and so forth. So, um, so what I want you to do before we go any further is read this story Read the story, uh, you know, two or three times. It's just only, it's only twelve hundred words, and when you read the story, then I would like you to make a list of the things, uh, of the just the points, just the things that happened. First thing that happened, second thing that happened, third thing that happened, um, and and I've done that uh, in in my um, in my thing, and uh, I've ended up ended up with this this list there. And, and I've got, I started out with 18, but you'll see when we go to the PowerPoint that I've, I've got it down to 15. And the reason was because when I went through it again, two became one because they're obviously uh, the same thing. So, um, and I, that's okay. That's the process. Um, so if I was printing this bit of paper again, I'd print 15, but I want you to do your own thing. So stop the, stop the, uh, the, the video thing now and just go read through it, make your own list. And then check your list against mine. Oh, I'm not right. I don't have the right answers, but I do have answers that I've thought about. And you can see, and it isn't a question of whether you're right or I'm right. The question is, what gives the best um, summary of the story? Because when we look at this summary, we have a bunch of facts, which are all what I would call uh, historical particulars. That is, things that happened that carried um, a revelation of how God works, not just in one occasion, with one group of people, but on every occasion with everyone. And I wanted to show you how to get from those historical particulars to the universal principles and how we test that out and see how it works. Because if we can get universal principles, those principles are the ones that we need to embrace with our heart, you know, uh, and we'll we'll see how to do that. So stop now and uh, then we can come back again and talk about uh, these things. I've got them on my PowerPoint and uh, we'll go through them uh, together so that you can get a bit of an idea. Okay, here we are, and um, this you've just read that, and so I've got uh, 15 here, 15 principles. I'm just going to go through them. You'll see them on the um, <clears throat> on the PowerPoint there, and uh, uh, I've talked about a couple of them last Sunday in church, but um, um, the first one uh, is starts in. At the beginning of the story, Paul first visited Ephesus with Priscilla and Aquila on his way back to Jerusalem from Corinth, and he spoke in the synagogue, uh, not of the elders. That's not true. Uh, I should I should um, change that. But I will later. Um, so he went into this. He, he he came there on his way from Corinth to Jerusalem, but he was there with an intention. And so that intention caused him to, he didn't just flip into town, get a hotel for the night, you know, and then move on the next bus or the next boat. Um, he was there with intention. He went and he, he stayed there long enough to go and speak in the synagogue and spoke there a number of times. You'll, you'll see that. Um, and so I, I want to think about now what is the universal principle of this? If this was a particular, what 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 does it represent in terms of a principle? Uh, you might find this a bit a bit different or whatever, but just hang with it. So I'm going to say that the the principle was that there were a group of people who went to a place with a kingdom of God intention. They were there to proclaim the kingdom of God, and that's what they went there for, 
And when they got there, they did that. And they chose a way to do it, and they found out how to continue and so forth. But they, this whole thing started with an intention. And I want to tell you this, there is never an occasion where some kingdom of God work won't start without somebody uh, being somewhere with an intention. The whole ministry of Jesus, he was there with an intention. Jesus' intention was to see what his father was doing and do that. And we have, you know, 180 or uh, more examples of that. So um, uh, so we can see what happened when Jesus went somewhere with an intention. So uh, same deal. So, um, so that's the first one, going to a place. Now, all I've done is I've said, what actually happened? Well, you've got, to, you've got to make this really simple, all right? Just say the obvious things, otherwise you'll miss it. Because we're not trying to interpret everything and have a you know, great interpretation. We're not trying to you know, give some great thing about the background or whatever. We're just trying to say what happened. And, and one day, Paul and Priscilla and Aquila showed up in town. They waited till the synagogue um, Sabbath meeting was on, and they went to the Sabbath meeting, and that synagogue heard a message that they'd never heard before a message about Jesus and so um, that's what started it and um, they listened and wanted them to come back and so forth and Paul uh, leap we're going to go to the second one now so the second thing is Paul left first he went there with an intention then he left with an intention um, so uh, he was going on to Jerusalem he had some things to do there um, and so there was a beginning but it wasn't complete um, and but that 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 wasn't the issue the issue wasn't oh no you can't leave now as Paul is an apostolic person, and we're going to get a picture through this of what apostolic ministry looks like. It's not as if, you know, it's some big A person who, you know, is an amazing person and they're the only people that get any revelation. It's just that Paul is he's painting on a bigger canvas. He's um, thinking about bigger issues. And so um, this issue about Ephesus has to wait. And he leaves Priscilla and Aquila there. Think about that. He leaves his team members there. Heads off. That'd be like me going to Griffith or Leeton and staying there for a few weeks and then leaving a couple of team members there and going on. And uh, so a couple of team members, um, you know, they stay there and they have a go for a while. But um, but Paul wasn't, he wasn't precious about it. He wasn't, you know, he didn't have his little gobby little fingerprints all over it and was controlling everything and micromanaging everything. He came, spoke the gospel um, whatever happened, we don't actually know. All we know is that they had favour in the in the um, synagogue, and then he left Priscilla and Aquila there, who knew the message and knew how it worked and so forth. And off he went to Jerusalem. And so the principle is that you know, even though you start something, even though you sort of might have to go and do something else, whatever, it isn't that it isn't somehow you just got to mollycoddle this. Uh, I don't know whether you know that word, but you know. You, um, you don't have to simply, you know, it's going to, if it all drops, to, falls to bits, it'll never get picked up again, da, 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 you know, all those idealisms are uh, blown away by this. The, the fact of the matter is that this was his principle. You know, he went there with a few people, left people there, he went on, and that teamwork is really important for Christian ministry. Uh, and it means that incomplete doesn't mean the end of the story. The small picture will always be part of the big picture. And, and no matter how small the work is, it is really important that that work sees themselves as part of the big picture. We have a problem like this because we have these little churches and people go to church there, they fellowship there, they socialize there, they do everything, and, and their world is just this little world. Well, sorry, that's not it. Um, a church has to begin with an apostolic character to it, and this church did. <clears throat> so the, the third one, this is the third um, particular that I wrote down, just a list. Apollos came from Alexandria with an incomplete understanding of the gospel, but continued to preach in the synagogue. Um, uh, yeah, elders, uh, that's just that's not supposed to be there either. So there's the Apollos comes. So Paul comes, Paul goes. Uh, Paul preaches, leaves uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Apollos comes. Apollos comes with some understanding of the gospel, but not the whole deal. So he preaches um, and uh Priscilla and Aquila hear him and they like him and they, all that kind of stuff, but he only knows a part of the story and so they fill him in on the rest of the story, but it doesn't take yet. Um, okay, so, and, and I love this because, you know, they could have said, ah, oh, Apollos, you blinking heretic, you know, you, you don't do it like we do it or whatever, but no, they they were happy to have Apollos there and, and uh, even happy to, when he had some time there and they showed him extra things and so forth, 
Interesting to me that they showed him the way of God more completely. That's what it says. But but nothing happened to the disciples. Um, so whatever was going on, it wasn't happening. You know, there were a few disciples there and and um, all that, but they weren't they weren't getting the whole deal. And even though Ananias, sorry, Ananias, uh, uh, who was it? Um, uh, the two, the two people um, that he left there, uh, Esquilla and Priscilla, Woo! bad deal. Um, even though he left them there, they still didn't cut it. They didn't cut it. It didn't disappear. They were still there. And when Apollos came, you know, it sort of gave a bit of a bit of a um, extra deal, but um, but it didn't still cut it. It wasn't. You know, multiplying like a kingdom of God works should multiply. So, but the principle is, give what you've got till you get more. Give everything you've got until you get more. When you get more, grab onto more. I mean, if the religious leaders in Jerusalem had got that principle, things would have been totally different. You know, but instead they said, no, we've got the lot. What we say is the lot. There's no more. And so they cut themselves out. You know, it's just terrible. So, you know, Apollos, obviously got a hold of more. That's the third principle. Um, here's the fourth. When Paul arrived from Galatia, there was 12, 12 men, a group of 12 men plus women and kids. Um, so we don't know, maybe 30 people, um, 35 people, who knows what. But uh, uh, so um, these disciples were there and these were the result of Paul's initial ministry of uh, Aquila and Priscilla's ministry and Apollos' ministry. And they were disciples. They'd believed in Jesus. Uh, they'd been baptized in a repentance kind of baptism. And uh, so when Paul comes in chapter 19 and the first few verses, he says, um, yeah, I know you're disciples, but did you get the Holy Spirit power? Because, you know, this isn't cutting. You know, the fact that we've got 12 people after all this time isn't cutting it. And the problem isn't with the circumstance. That's what we'd do today. We'd say, you know, um, the circumstances are difficult or whatever else. And Paul says, no, 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 it's Holy Spirit power. That's what makes the difference. And we need to learn that, you know. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. The problem is not with them. The problem is with us. We are the problem because uh, we are the solution. And until we are the solution, we are the problem. Uh, anyway, um, so start with what you got. Paul didn't have to. He started with those people. He just made sure those people got the, the full the full deal because he wasn't, you know, this is Jesus as well because Jesus um, started with a small group of people, 120 people. Um, he didn't, you know, he, he just started with what he had. At one point in time, he thought they were all going to go away, John chapter 6. Um, but there's not some, there's some idea that we've got to have an idealistic critical mass and, you um, you know, often church planning is done with this sort of horrible humanistic idealism in mind. Uh, so we've got to have a worship team and we've got to have a building and we've got to have 50 people or whatever else. Um, no, a church can just start with two disciples or three or 12. Um, whoever's there, really, start with what you got. You know, if you're the only family somewhere, well, start, you know, start being the church uh, there and then go from what you've got to what you haven't got. Don't wait for some idealistic critical mass, although they were waiting for a, an apostolic connection. So um, when Paul came, because he was apostolic, and I, I would say this to any church, any group that isn't cutting it, go find apostolic connections. Go find the people who can equip you with what you haven't got so that you can get what you haven't got. Remember, the problem is you. It isn't somebody else. The problem is you. It's not happening. The problem is you. If the problem is you, then get the answer. That is, get equipping for the things you haven't got. These guys didn't have the Holy Spirit, so um, you know, so they they had to um, get the Holy Spirit, and then when they got the Holy Spirit, they were able to they were able to pump. Um, so make sure you got the full equipment. Um, and when Paul came there, he was doing exactly what Jesus said in the Gospels. Don't. Don't start to do this ministry unless you have Holy Spirit power. Don't start doing it with human you know, ability, human ingenuity, human systems. I cannot tell you how badly we do this, but um, that's what happened. So when Paul found they'd not been <coughs> fully connected to Jesus, he baptized them in Jesus' name 
and prayed for them to be filled with the Spirit. Don't don't despise those really basic things. I mean, I've been doing ministry for a long time, and I find that um, uh, that if somebody's got problems, I always go back to the beginning. Do they have a relationship with Jesus? Have they repented, you know, and received forgiveness? Do they have they been joined to Jesus through baptism in water, in the name of Jesus, Father and Son, the Holy Spirit? And have they received the Holy Spirit? Because that's that's the basic equipment, you know. You can't you can't serve Jesus unless you've experienced forgiveness. You can't serve Jesus unless you have a faith relationship with Him. You can't serve Jesus unless you are joined to Him in that supernatural way through baptism in water. Uh, and you can't serve Jesus without the Holy Spirit. So, um, so the principle is make sure you've got the full deal. Here were these guys; they were just holding out there. There were twelve disciples in all, twelve men, uh, but they were just holding out, and um, they needed power. And Paul came along. He was the apostolic guy that needs that was able to bring uh, that dimension. He knew about what they didn't have. He could look at them and see. Now I don't know why. Aquila and Priscilla didn't see that. I don't know why. You know, it says they knew everything, but who knows what? Well, I don't care why. The issue is they got what they needed, you know. And we know they got what they needed because the next part of it keeps on going. Um, uh, so number six. Number six historical particular was Paul preached in the synagogue for three months and saw people become followers. Okay. Now, they had, they had 12 plus the women and kids and so forth. So Paul went back to the synagogue. Now, you have to think about this. If the synagogue is the historical particular, what is the universal principle? What is the today version in a Western city like Canberra, Australia? What is the, the cultural equivalent of the synagogue? Well, um, like, just think about this. I reckon it's the group of people in a region or an area who are closest to God, but not cutting it, not doing it. Okay, so if I'm up in uh, Emu Ridge trying to preach the gospel there and make disciples, uh, I'm looking for people who are already disciples or they're disobedient disciples or they're not cutting it disciples or whatever else, and I'm looking for the people I know who are close to God because I think they're the ones who are going to be the most likely to um, take up the whole deal, which is to preach the gospel, make disciples, plant churches and multiply. So um, so you start where the people are the closest to God. And, and synagogues might be like, in, in those days, might be like churches of today, churches where people are not preaching the gospel, they don't care about making disciples, they're not interested in the outside community and so forth, they're just locked up in their own little world. Um, maybe that's uh, maybe when you go to an area, you've got to say, let's go to the churches first of all, because they're the ones who are supposed to know God. And let's let's talk about the you know uh, the heart of the Father. Let's talk about the Great Commission. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit power, and let's talk about that kind of um, uh, missional church, Great Commission church. And if people accept that, then they become part of that movement. Um, if they don't, then we simply go with the ones that do. So, but start in any place. Just if you're in a sphere, in a neighborhood, in a workplace, just start with the people who are already closest to God. Just gather them and, and impart the vision of seeing the kingdom of God come uh, and the message to everybody. Um, that's number six. Number seven, some of the leaders in the, in the synagogue publicly opposed Paul's message. And so Paul left the synagogue and began uh, a meeting in the hall of Tyrannus. Uh, now, <clears throat> once again, that's a historical particular. It was a pushback. You know, people were beginning to follow Jesus. Uh, the people who owned the synagogue didn't really um, uh, didn't know. They didn't like what was going on. They didn't like this new doctrine. You know, this different deal. They didn't like the kingdom of God. They liked the, the traditional kingdom of Israel. The traditional. They they didn't even like what the things they were doing pointed to. Paul showed them the reality, the fullness, Jesus, and they would rather have the shadow. It says these things are a shadow, but the, the, the substance is in Jesus. And so um, they rejected, so they pushed back. So, you know, um, this has happened in churches all the time. People push back on the idea that we should be proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, planting churches and all that sort of stuff. We should be uh, ministering out of Holy Spirit, supernatural power, and we should be, you know, giving, being the expression of the Father's heart, indiscriminate, redemptive love, and so forth. And um, so people push back on that. 
And so here's a principle, you know, um, treat, treat opposition as an alternative opportunity. Treat opposition as an alternative opportunity. Compromising the strategy without compromising the purpose. Were there other places that Paul could preach the gospel? Yeah, plenty of other places. You know, so he just left the synagogue and um, went down the road and got a hall and people gathered there and he began training and equipping people there. And so, you know, he could have been, so, you know, he could have took his ball and gone out of the synagogue and complained and moaned and blamed the synagogue leaders and they're the people who don't like us and that's the reason why we're doing no good. There's no excuse. You know, there is no excuse because opposition is going to come and the first opposition will almost always come from the people who think that they're close to God, but aren't. You know, so, uh, so look for the alternative, the alternative that will see the vision fulfilled. Now, because we're going to be 100%, 100% intentional. Um, I've just been reminded of that recently. So, you know, uh, the, the vision, the goal cannot just be set aside for the sake of relationship, for the sake of not causing offence or whatever else. Um, that's number seven. Number eight. Wow, what's this? Uh, within two years, Paul and his team had discipled and sent missionaries to every part of the province of Asia. Four to six million people heard the gospel. Um, that's the historical particular, and it, it's really funny because it's quaint in the uh, in the story. They said uh, that Paul. Um, uh, uh, he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily, discussions daily in the hall of the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And so um, Paul just went down the road with the people who wanted to serve the vision. He didn't castigate. He didn't criminalize. He didn't, you know, start a new denomination or anything like that. He just simply got on with the job. Um, I love that. He just got on. Jesus did that. He just he didn't sort of create big barriers and so forth. He just kept on preaching the kingdom of God. That picked the fights. He kept on, you know, preaching the kingdom of God, and and that's that's how the thing went forward. So, the the thing for Jesus was that he was not going to stop preaching the kingdom of God. Paul was not going to stop preaching the gospel, and so that meant finding another place. So, if things don't work out, find another place. Don't make enemies out of anybody. Uh, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. So, Paul, there's no evidence here that Paul started to, you know, put placards out or go and protest outside the the synagogue, that they were godless and going to hell. Um, he just simply got on with the job. This is so important. This is what transforms the city. What stops transformation is when we take our eyes off the game and focus on who might be different from us or not as good as us or whatever else like that. Um, so I haven't got that one in there. Number eight. Here's number nine. Um, now, you know, this is this is amazing and I think, oh no, oh God, give us this because I don't see enough miracles, not enough signs and wonders. We see a few, but not enough. But a season of extraordinary miracles were done through Paul. You know, people got handkerchiefs and all those things. Um, so, you know, uh, the way this comes out, uh, it actually um, shows that this was a season. You know, uh, after all these other things happened, then this began to happen. There was like this overflow of signs and wonders and miracles. It didn't happen the same way before, but now it was the feature. Now, sometimes we'd like to think that, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. And when it isn't, we try and make it. We try and, you know, put it all together, whatever, you know, ourselves. Uh, but but there are seasons for things, and, and um, I wish it wasn't so. But it is true. So we've got to hang in there. We've got to do everything we know how to do. We've got to keep on speaking the message. But there will be seasons of great uh, outpouring of, of miracles. And we can't get our eyes off the purpose onto the miracles. We just have to look uh, to the purpose and see that sometimes there are greater miracles than others. So discover and embrace the phases of the work of God. Everything that can happen doesn't happen all the time. Uh, please get that. Everything that can happen doesn't happen all the time. And in this season, there was amazing miracles. And maybe God was getting things in position. And now there was the miracle. First he was using the preaching in the synagogue. Then he was using the multiplying disciples. Now he's using, you know, uh, signs and wonders and miracles and so forth. And this became known, you know. Um, and uh, so... You have to give yourself to the phase, you know. So we've, we've got different denominations. Instead of having different seasons, we've got different denominations. 
It's really pathetic, you know. So one denomination represents a season. Why should it do that? Why shouldn't they be part of the new season? Well, because they've rejected the new season. And some people who've taken hold of the new season think that they're the, the bee's knees, you know, they're the everything, and then they look down on everybody else until they become the, you know, has-beens, and somebody else starts doing it. So we all got to take note. And then, then here was something that happened. Um, when this miracle thing started to happen, it got out of control, and some Jewish exorcist tried to, you know, railroad this thing and to use it for their own purposes, and so they, they tried to cast out a demon in a demon-possessed man using the name of Jesus, even though they weren't related to Jesus, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And this and this demon took over the man, and because they weren't in the covering of that authority and so forth with Jesus, uh, they got beaten up, and everybody heard about it. You know, So here was God using something totally outside the church's control or influence, and you can get so precious and so controlling of everything that you think that you're the only one doing it. And outside, God is using a bunch of Jewish exorcists to simply proclaim the word in a different kind of way. We don't need to be afraid of the intrusions of the enemy because God has a power and a capacity to do things that we never heard of and never thought of. And he can take the things that the enemy's trying to do and turn them around to make them serve the gospel. That's exactly what happened here. So don't let us get, you know, that's the enemy. They're against, we're against them. They're against us. They shouldn't be doing this. And we've got them all named and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. We just sort of get on with the job and realize that when things like that go on, we simply... Uh, see the sovereignty of God working and see how God um, you know, uses that to his glory. That's number 10. <clears throat> number 11. Now, after this, this is suddenly... Well, sorry, I should have said that. Um, the, the name of Jesus was held in high honor everywhere. I mean, think about that. Here they were preaching, training and everything else inside the church. Then some sons of Siva, seven sons of Siva. Sounds good. Sounds poetic. Um, they went and tried to do, dust up this demon and got belted up themselves. You think, oh, no, this is terrible because they don't represent us and all that. And, um, and then this became known around the city. And the next thing is there's this wave of repentance. Now, you know, that, that's, why, that's why it's really important to understand the seasons because there was a wave of disciple making. There was a wave of healing. There was a wave, uh, like a out of control thing, and then this wave of repentance, and people brought their books and everything, and suddenly the whole thing wasn't in Tyrannus's Hall anymore. It was all over the place, around the city, and um, uh, God's, you know, multiplying the ministry and so forth. Um, and it happened. All this, the 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 burning of books happened because of the seven sons of Siva, not because Paul and his companions were smart. Think about that. Paul sent, then sends Erastus and Timothy to Macedonia. Then he sends off a couple of the key team members and he prepares himself to go to Jerusalem. So he thinks, okay, well, we're now going to move off. Um, and this, uh, as I've probably said before, you know, is apostolic leadership. A church needs to be apostolic. By that, I don't mean some big A guy who got a, you know, got a car park and a, you know, big room and all that sort of stuff and, and gets money from everybody because he's an apostle or she's an apostle. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying this is apostolic. It actually is the big picture, the biggest picture. This Paul is not just thinking about Ephesus. He's thinking about Macedonia. Uh, he's thinking about other places and so forth. Um, and so he's going to go on to Macedonia and Greece and then go back to Jerusalem. Um, so apostolic leaders carries leadership carries and serves the big picture. Every church needs apostolic leadership. I don't mean that every pastor is an apostle. They need to get their apostolic vision, their apostolic connection, you know, from somewhere. Now, this is this is a season for this. We're seeing the beginning of this. Every ministry needs apostolic leadership, but we'll never be able to own control and be possessive of it. You know, they need to uh, recognize that, receive from that, connect with that, keep on connecting with that. Uh, but but so realize that they're part of this bigger picture because the apostolic ministry uh, gives them the sense of the big picture as well as the sense of what um, what is needed uh, to be a part of that. Um, and Paul is always writing. When he writes to people, he's always saying, 
Now this one, that one, he's always connecting people with other things that are going on and all that sort of stuff just because he wants people to realize that this picture is a big picture. God has established a plan that involves the whole of the earth and so we're just connecting with each other so that we can be part of the fulfillment of that plan. Sadly, people have defined the kingdom of God by their own denomination, their own theological viewpoint or whatever, just messes everything up. Uh, number 11, there was a great disturbance in the city caused by business people whose livelihood was impacted by the gospel. These business people were making money from, you know, the idolatry and so forth. Now, we're not, we're not sort of um, de -de 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 idolatry. We're not saying that here. Um, but uh, we are saying that there's no such thing as a kingdom coming without the kingdom of darkness being challenged. You know, it's not an empty space. There is already a kingdom there. And in this case, it was a kingdom that made money from the worship of Diana. When Diana's uh, shares started to fall, people were not interested in worshipping there anymore. The silversmiths and so forth didn't make as much money and then they got all upset and everything else like that. So they're going to go after the church, um, not because the church has deliberately you know, gone out to make them broke, Actually, this happens every kind of revival. There's always a reaction. All of the kingdoms of darkness will be challenged by the kingdom message. Transformation will never come to a city or region without a fight. You've got to be understanding of which way the fight is. And please understand this. Just think of the weapons. If we went back through this and thought, what were the weapons, the tools that um, Paul and the believers used to fight this battle? None of them were placarding against... They didn't go to the temple... Of Diana and say down with Diana. Uh, they didn't protest to the government and get the government to change laws about Diana. No, they just preached the gospel, made disciples, gathered people in churches, multiplied disciples, multiplied churches. Godliness began to happen within the lives of people, and they stopped wanting to worship Diana. You know, because what the what the gospel gives you is not a different moral code. It's actually he the gospel displaces the things. So worshiping Diana becomes like having two left shoes. You know, I don't need two left shoes. I've only got one left foot, so I don't need two left shoes. And so the thing that doesn't mean anything anymore is overtaken because now I love Jesus. Now I'm serving Jesus. Now I want to be like Jesus. Now I believe in Jesus. Now I trust Jesus. Now I want to obey Jesus. So Diana, who cares about Diana? That's just a bunch of who are anyway. Um, so we have to understand that this is going to be out of our hands. It's not going to be a fight we pick, but the kingdom of God, the battle for the kingdom of God, will pick that fight. So number 12, two of the believers were dragged into the midst of an angry crowd in the public arena. Uh, that's the historical particular. And so what's the general principle? Well, the clash of kingdoms will come sometimes cause suffering and, and um, persecution and jail and death. Um, we cannot allow personal comfort and safety to shape what we do or don't do if we're going to serve the kingdom. We can just serve the kingdom and, and face whatever's coming. You know, this is around the world. I mean, I, I just read that 108,000 um, people had been martyred for being Christians this past 12 months. So um, they're people that I want to honour because, um, you know, we can say, oh, I hope we don't have to suffer. Well, you know, you can you can find yourself not proclaiming the kingdom of God just because it's more comfortable. And I reckon that's what we've got here. We've got a church in Australia that doesn't proclaim the kingdom of God because it doesn't threaten the kingdom of darkness. If you think going up to the parliament and, you know, complaining about gay marriage is threatening the kingdom, it doesn't. Preaching the gospel, making disciples, who can preach the gospel, make disciples, who will want to have you know, marriage between a woman and a man, that's the best way to fight this kingdom. Um, sorry, I know that's not going to please everybody, but uh, this is the way it was. Transformation came to the city because of proclaiming the kingdom of God. They didn't need status. They didn't need a law to be passed. No matter what happened in the civic realm, the gospel still got proclaimed. You know, um, It's just that we have to make a decision about whether we're going to proclaim the kingdom have it challenge the kingdom of darkness and live with the... That, that can be in a home, you know. Kingdoms of darkness can happen in a home. You can be misunderstood, misrepresented, you know, all those other things in your family, in your household, in your workplace. And uh, if we start, you know, uh, cultivating things so that we avoid persecution, that's what we've done. And that's why we have a church that 
has no power. Number 13, Paul wanted to speak to the crowd. I love this. The crowd's gathering and they drag a couple of guys in there and, and all Paul wants to do is preach. There's a crowd, let's preach the gospel. Um, and so, uh, but the, the leaders, the other people in the team and the, some of the prominent citizens who were connected to Paul, they said, hey, listen, mate, no, stay out of it. And here's the great thing. Paul, the great and mighty apostle, stayed out of it. This is just, this is why we need team. This is why no apostolic ministry is good enough on its own. You know, it needs to, it needs to be connected to people who can say, hey, Paul, don't do it. And he says, oh, okay. A godly committed team will always trump the wisdom of an individual, no matter how anointed or godly they might be. I just find this all the time. People are not in teams. They're on their own. Even if they've got names somewhere, they go visit somebody somewhere, their daily life, their daily operation is not in a team. And they are you know, candidates for a fall, candidates for messing up. You know. And number 14, God uses a non-believer, the clerk of the city, to resolve a difficult situation. So the clerk of the city comes and he says, Oi, boys, you know, I know that you're all upset and everything, but we've got courts to deal with this stuff. And so like Gamaliel in the Sanhedrin um, for um, Jesus, so the clerk of the city in the, um, the arena where the people were gathered became an ally to the Christian work there, the work of the kingdom. No, he didn't, real, he didn't think he was doing them a favour. All he was doing was upholding the law. So, you know, if you're saying now we've got to, you know, build a, it all depends on us. No, God's got people. God's got people who do his bidding. Cyrus, Cyrus was like that. Cyrus was a pagan king who did something that served the purposes of God. God has people like that all over the place. That's what's so wonderful. And so God will raise up unlikely allies from unlikely quarters. We should never think that God's resources are restricted to those of us who are in the room. Um, wonderful principle. <clears throat> Number 15, and the last one, Paul left for Macedonia and Greece and never returned in person to the church in Ephesus. He left the church in the hands of local leaders supported by visits from apostolic team. Multiplication demands apostolic step back. Multiplication, no matter which area of the work you're talking about, there will be no multiplication until there's apostolic step back, until leaders step back as soon as, as soon as they can, step back and let people take that. That's how to multiply. And when that doesn't happen, it just reduces, reduces, reduces. This has been a principle. We've got great leaders who cannot let go. We've got great leaders who somehow get their ego on the road and do not let other leaders, you know, they don't create space for them. They're so full of their own importance. They think that everything depends on them. It never has done. It never will do. It won't start doing it now. And so, you know, that, that sort of leadership isn't kingdom leadership. Uh, but this is godly leadership. Paul took off and left for Greece and left. It. He came and talked to the elders, didn't come and talk to the church. He wrote a letter. He was still connected, still loved them, but it was from a distance. And so that, that's why, you know, in one of the T4T principles is model, assist, watch, leave. That is the key to apostolic multiplying leadership in whatever level, whatever sphere of the, of the work you're talking about. So there you go. What 12 disciples can do. I love this. We're going to think about these principles and see how many of them are operating in their life. Just, you know, do a little tick box thing and say, is that happening? Is that happening? Is that happening? Um, and see if we can get more of it happening because these kinds of principles change cities. They take ordinary people, do amazing things, and bring transformation to a whole city, not just a city, but a region. I want that. I want that for Canberra, this region, for Australia, and beyond. You know, I want this kind of transformation. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would let us take hold of these things and just walk with them and live with them and see how and let them shape you know, the way we do things and what we try and do so that we will have that kind of um, capacity. I know we have opportunity, but we need opportunity with capacity. And so help us to have both the capacity to make the most of the opportunity so that your intention 
like it was with Ephesus, to change a city will be fulfilled. And you could write to them a long time later and say, hey, listen, you've done amazing things. You lost your first love, but you know, you've done amazingly well. And we want to hear that as well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.